I'm Daniel Barnett from Outer Temple Chambers and welcome to this webinar on harassment and I'm joined today by Paul Livingston from Outer Temple Chambers. Paul is a specialist employment and discrimination law barrister. He also specializes in public inquiries and practices from Outer Temple Chambers. He's an expert in advising individuals and businesses about discrimination and harassment at work, particularly what organizations can do to tackle the issue preemptively and what individuals can do to make sure they have the best possible evidence of what's happened. Paul Livingstone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel, uh, for inviting me to speak and for raising so much money uh, for FRU uh, in doing these series of webinars. So I, I think one of the beauties of employment law is that we get to work on things which are interesting not just in the nerdy way, but also in a way that grabs newspaper headlines and actually engages non-lawyers. And harassment is just one of these issues. So although the hashtag Me Too was first coined by Tarana Burke in 2006, it started to gain traction in October 2017, following allegations against Harvey Weinstein. And as you all know, for two years thereafter, from leering diners at the President's Club to an inordinate amount of hugging at Ted Baker, the issue dominated the headlines. Now, I'm already hearing some examples of harassment during lockdown, uh, racist messages on Slack, managers wearing inappropriate pajamas on Zoom calls, but you'll be happy to know that this webinar is not focusing on COVID-19. Uh, it's gonna focus on harassment under the Equality Act 2010, normally. So there are three forms of harassment, harassment related to protected characteristic, sexual harassment, and rejection submission harassment. So I'm gonna go through them. First of all, harassment related to protected characteristic. As you all know, that requires unwanted conduct that is related to a protected characteristic and has the purpose or effect of violating a person's dignity or creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating, or offensive environment for that individual. So first, looking at unwanted conduct. Now, conduct can include a wide range of behavior. The EHRC code gives some examples, such as spoken or written words, abuse, imagery, graffiti, physical gestures, facial expressions, mimicry, jokes, pranks, and other physical behavior. So pretty much anything can amount to conduct. Now, the issue of unwanted uh, is a fairly common sense approach. It means the same as unwelcome or uninvited, but difficulties can arise, for example, where there's a series of incidents and an employer argues that the claimant actively participated in the conduct and therefore it can't be unwanted. So in English and Thomas Sanderson from 2010, the EA, in an EAT case, there was a pretty awful culture in which the claimant had participated for some years actively, including he himself name calling and writing sexist and ageist articles. And he was the subject of a lot of uh, homophobic abuse, although he was also, he was heterosexual. However, at one point, he made a written complaint and asked for the innuendo about his sexuality to stop. So the EAT looked at the whole timeline and held that there was no harassment in relation to the initial period, because during that period, the individual had made it clear that they did not object to the conduct and therefore it was not unwanted. However, there's a need, as they said, to scrutinize whether there's a tipping point. So in that case, the AT held that the claimant had participated in the conduct up to a certain point, but the subsequent conduct after that complaint that he made crossed the line and became unwanted. And similarly, in Smith and Ideal Shopping Direct Limited, uh, where the claimant was openly gay and had participated in some self-referential comments about his sexual orientation, at some point, more pointed remarks began to be used. And the EAT said that a line can be drawn as to when conduct goes beyond what the individual was agreeing to and then crosses the border to deliberate insulting language. They said, we quite accept that a person who parades their particular characteristic loudly and vocally might expect to receive from colleagues responses or comments which make reference to that sexuality. But that is quite different to the abusive use of references to sexual orientation or other protected characteristics. Moving now to the criterion of related to. I'm not going to cover this in too much detail, as in my experience, it's rarely the issue. But it's important to note that just because a claimant perceives conduct to be related to their protected characteristic, that isn't determinative. 
It's an objective matter for the ET drawing upon all the evidence. And that, that was recently espoused in the case of T's esque and Where Valley's NHS Foundation Trust v. Aslan. So in that case, there was a comment made in the claimant's hearing about ISIS, and the claimant said that that was related to her British and Asian Indian race. But the, the tribunal fell into error because it only focused on whether the claimant perceived the remarks to be related to race, and they said that's not determinative of the question, and ET has to decide for itself whether it's related. And further, as you all probably know, although uh, the conduct has to be related to a protected characteristic, the claimant doesn't have to have that protected characteristic. So if anti-Semitic comments are made about Jewish people, someone who's non-Jewish could still complain as long as the other criteria are fulfilled. Now moving on to purpose or effect. So to reiterate, it has to have the purpose or effect, that conduct, of either violating a person's dignity or creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment. And it's crucial, as you all know, to remember that it's purpose or effect. So the purpose of the conduct, someone intending for it to have that effect, in my experience, is quite rare in harassment cases. But where it does come up, it relies on the analysis of the alleged harasser's motive or intention in the conduct. But the more common one is effect, where somebody perhaps, or at least says, they don't mean for something to offend someone, but it does. So the statute says that we should consider a number of things. And it's a mixed objective and subjective test. So this was set out recently by the Court of Appeal in Pemberton and Inwood in 2018. They said that the tribunal should approach these matters by considering, firstly, whether the claimant felt or perceived her dignity to be violated or the environment to be created. So that's the subjective question. Next, whether it was reasonable for the conduct to have that effect. That's the objective question. And then all the other circumstances. And the other circumstances can, can include a wide variety of things, such as the mental health or capacity of the individual, cultural norms, previous experiences of harassment, etc. Now, where we're, you're looking at the effect of a series of incidents, uh, the case law, of, uh, in particular, Reed versus Steadman in, from 1999. Uh, says that the tribunal shouldn't just isolate every individual incident and look at the effect of that, but should instead adopt a more cumulative approach, keeping in mind that the impact of separate incidents might accumulate, which is, I think, sensible. Now, the fact that an employee is slightly upset or mildly offended by conduct is, may not be enough to argue that the necessary effect has taken place. And the courts have been keen to emphasize the importance of not encouraging, and I quote, a culture of hypersensitivity or the imposition of legal liability in respect of every unfortunate phrase. And that's from Richmond Pharmacology and Dhaliwal from 2009. So a recent example of that, or fairly recent, is Heafield and Times newspaper, where there was a busy newsroom where somebody had said, does anyone know what's happened to the effing Pope? Now, the claimant, who was Roman Catholic, made a claim for harassment related to religious belief, and the tribunal upheld by the EAT said that that did not have the necessary purpose or effect. The objective test was not satisfied, so any insult was not regarded as reasonable. Moving on to sexual harassment, uh, that requires unwanted conduct that is of a sexual nature, and it has the purpose or effect. The conduct can again be a wide variety of things, comments, touching, uh, advances, etc. Uh, when looking at whether it's unwanted, it's important to look at the specific allegations of sexual harassment. So just because somebody's joined in in some banter does not mean they consent to crude sexual comments. And even if conduct has been going on for a long time with no apparent objection, that can still be unwanted conduct. And that's from the case of Munchkin's Restaurant and Camerism, 2010. The EAT sensibly held that there are plenty of reasons why people don't object to conduct or raise a complaint. And so in that case, for example, the claimants were migrant workers who had no certainty of employment if they left. In my view, this is quite an important case which should signpost the likely direction that a tribunal would now take in these more enlightened times, I hope, where conduct has been going over for a long time and no complaint has been made. 
we know from research on sexual violence that it takes a long time for people to come forward. And I think with sexual harassment, a similar uh, view might be taken. Um, on the question of what is sexual, the guidance just says it's common sense. Obviously, there'll be some cases that are inherently sexual, some cases where it won't be. Moving on very briefly to the issue of vicarious liability, I'm not going to cover this in detail, but it can often be an issue with harassment. So an employer will be vicariously liable for harassment if it happens in the course of employment and in the context of socialising, uh, this will apply also to situations which are extensions of the workplace. And other circumstances which might be relevant are things like the dynamic of power. So a senior manager and a junior employee, even if outside of work, is more likely to be, lead to vicarious liability. Um, there's no liability for third party harassment anymore since the repeal of Section 40 of the Equality Act, and that was recently confirmed in Naylard versus Unite the Union and the case of Besong from 2020. The only protection for third party harassment can be in other provisions uh, and potentially as a breach of mutual trust and confidence leading to a resignation and constructive dismissal. And, and finally, I'm going to look at the, the statutory defence. So under Section 1094, uh, an employer has a defence if it shows that it took all reasonable steps to prevent A from doing that thing or from anything of that description. And in the case of Canleth and East Riding of Yorkshire Council, the EAT said that the test is A, whether any preventative steps were taken, B, whether there were any further preventative steps that could have been taken which were reasonably practicable. And then the question of whether such steps would have actually prevented the discrimination is relevant but not determinative. And it's important when looking at the statutory defence that you look at what happened before, so not just the response. I'm happy to answer questions about this issue, um, but um, I think my time is almost up. One slightly sanctimonious thing to conclude with is that I think it's crucial to understand the importance of harassment as a societal issue rather than a narrow legal issue. So to think a bit more broadly about how to prevent and respond to harassment, because failure to do so allows a pretty negative culture to be fostered and it has a variety of problems with morale, employees going off sick, reputational damage, recruitment challenges, regulatory issues. To look a bit more broadly at the culture is my advice. Don't just focus on a narrow claim. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you very much. And now we're going to take your questions. Paul Livingston from Outer Temple Chambers is going to answer uh, all of the questions, we hope, if there's time, on harassment in discrimination claims. The first question is from Gillian Howard, uh, who's got the most thumbs up. Uh, Gillian, you seem to be asking the most popular questions at most of these webinars. Um, Gillian asks, the words unwanted conduct in the Equality Act is considered by an employment tribunal objectively. What evidence would an employment tribunal need to see to make a finding of sexual harassment if at the time the claimant went along with the harassment or didn't give any rebuffing responses, as is often the case when the harasser is her boss? Paul Livingston. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, uh, thanks for that, Gillian. Um, I think that the issue when it comes to unwanted conduct here is about how the claimant uh, can show what was happening at that time. And we've seen in more recent cases that there can be quite a wide variety of evidence that you can point to. So if there's evidence of the claimant sending WhatsApp messages or Facebook messages to friends or emails to friends and um, saying, you know, this is creeping me out, this is, um, I, I, this is horrible, but I'm going along with it, that sort of evidence is really helpful and, and is quite uh, commonly there because people do often talk to people outside of work about the problems. Um, I, I think that hopefully our understanding of this issue has progressed a bit and we understand that people do um, sort of coercively consent to conduct sometimes. And so I would hope that a tribunal would take a pretty broad view on um, whether conduct was wanted, even if they weren't outwardly objecting to it uh, and they look at other things like that. But my experience, I don't know if you agree with this, Paul, is that tribunals tend to be driven on this issue by the result they want to achieve. So if they want to find for the claimant, they'll find it's unwanted. And if they want a reason to find against the claimant, they'll say the claimant went along with that sort of conduct, um, was, was part and parcel, it was just office banter, uh, and it wasn't unwanted. And whilst that might not be the correct statutory approach, that is an approach I find some tribunals tend to take. Is, is that your experience? 
Yeah, I think that's right. I, I think also um, tribunals can think that some conduct is almost inherently unwanted. So in that case of Smith and the idea of shopping, they sort of said, and, and there was um, there's a couple of other cases like that. There was there was one in which somebody suggested to an employee that they should turn up to an interview wearing a see-through blouse and a short skirt because then she'd get promoted. And she didn't complain at the time, um, but the tribunal and the EAT held that that was inherently unwanted and it was obviously unwanted. Um, and I think that that can apply to, to other cases as well. A question from Neil Coombs. Neil asks, employers often rely on the statutory defence that a harasser has been given a copy of the Equal Opportunities Policy. How likely is this to succeed? Paul, perhaps you can explain what the statutory defence is as part of your answer. Yeah, so again, the statutory defence is the, the defence I referred to, which is that an employer has taken reasonable steps uh, to prevent the, the, the discrimination or harassment from happening um, under Section 109. So, so Neil, in, in my view, that uh, is almost certain to fail as, a, as an attempt at defence. Just saying that you've given out your equal opportunities policy uh, is not going to be enough. Um, there's, there's an ET case, but no further authority called Quasi, where and the ET held that simply issuing a policy or doing a small amount of training is not enough. And the EHRC says that you've got to make sure people are aware of the policy um, and what will happen if you breach the policy, ensure managers receive training, um, and, and it, that might start to be enough. My view is that in order to successfully rely on the statutory defence, especially given the times we're in now, that you need to do quite a bit more. So I think you need a policy, you need to... Uh, review it regularly. You need to make sure managers are familiar with it and it's properly disseminated. You've got to have training on the policy because no one reads policies. And I think you've also got to have a proper complaints process. So something that actually encourages people to report. Um, so for example, the Bar Council uses this uh, website called talktospot.com, which I advised on. Um, and that enables the recording and disclosure of allegations of harassment and discrimination. And also if I think the, the best evidence that you can succeed on a statutory defence is to say that cases of harassment have happened in the past and I have responded well to them and here's the evidence of that. I don't know what you think about that, Daniel. Yeah, I totally agree. Neil, if you came to my masterclass in 2019, masterclass uh, 2019.co.uk or .com, I forget which one. Um, there's a transcript there, and I spoke for about 40 minutes on the statutory defence. I was far more boring than Paul, who's just condensed it into uh, 45 seconds. But absolutely what Paul said is bang on correct. And I actually think it's a remarkably bad idea in most situations to try to rely on the statutory defence if you're a lawyer, unless it's a claim that could be right, giving rise to hundreds of thousands in compensation and you really want to fight everything. Because if you rely on the statutory defence, first of all, you're sending a signal to the tribunal that you don't back up your managers, which isn't always the right uh, message you want to be sending. Second of all, you're forcing that manager to go and get a separate firm of lawyers who very often you might have to pay for anyway. And even if you choose not to, the chances are they're going to get lawyers who are probably not as good as the lawyers you as a business are paying for. Uh, and you really don't want a not so experienced, not so good firm of lawyers coming along and messing up the substantive defense as they try to simultaneously defeat your st reliance on the statute defence. Um, it's got to be pretty extreme for an employer to throw a manager to the wolves. By far the better thing is to investigate internally and if something has gone wrong to deal with it in that way. N Neil, great question. Thank you. A uh, question from Mike Klein. With your experience of harassment cases, what quick tips would you offer small employers to do what they can to avoid harassment issues? Paul Livingston. Thanks, uh, Mike. Yeah, so I think one of the really important things is for employers of basically any size to not just assume that there is no harassment in their business. If, you, if you're an HR manager or a general counsel and you come to me and say, no, we've got a perfect culture, no harassment claims, I think my, resp my response is going to be that that is uh, indicative of a culture where people do not speak up because harassment happens, sexual harassment happens and all other types of harassment happens. And so my view is that the best thing a small employer can do um, 
is to preemptively try, try and deal with it. So having a proper complaints procedure so that people can complain before it gets to an employment tribunal is what you really want. And so I think even having some sort of procedure where people can make anonymous complaints if they're not willing to come forward, as they often aren't in small businesses, um, I think that's a really good thing because as soon as someone complains, they often don't want sort of really severe action. They often don't want to bring a tribunal claim because it's a huge amount of stress. And so if you can deal with it before that tribunal claim, you're hopefully uh, improving the culture without having to have legal liability. Uh, thank you, Mike. And for, for myself, I just add the words, uh, don't be an arse. That's what I tell employers. Don't be an arse and you'll probably be fine a lot of the time. Uh, Jenna Sadler asks, can you give some advice about what to do if an employee who's facing disciplinary and sickness action, I assume that means some form of uh, sickness absence management, claims procedural harassment. So I think what Gemma's asking, Paul, is if you subject an employee to performance management or absent management procedures, and they turn around and say, doing that is harassing me, how would you respond? Yeah, so I think, sorry, yeah, so I, I think that um, harassment and bullying, in fact, are often misunderstood by employees um, to mean that they've not been treated well. Um, I think it's important to remember that uh, legally harassment only occurs where it's unwanted conduct related to a protected characteristic, and it has that effect. So just because an employee says that they're feeling harassed because you're putting them through disciplinary procedures um, doesn't necessarily mean it well or even can amount to harassment. If um, I was taking a hypothetical that employee was disabled and they said that what you were doing in taking sickness absence action against that employee uh, was harassment related to the disability, I think that in that case you just need to um, you know, look, at all the, look at all the facts but make sure that what you're doing um, is not related to their disability but is related to their absence and the, uh, the way in which you're acting is reasonable. Because when it comes to the effect, as I said, uh, there's this mixed subjective and objective test. So if you act reasonably and it's not reasonable for that employee to have this sort of adverse environment created, then you should be okay. We're asking questions on harassment in discrimination cases to Paul Livingston of Outer Temple Chambers. And we have about 25 minutes left. Kelly asks, how easy is it for a tribunal to draw an inference that behaviour is connected to a protected characteristic? Uh, Paul Livingston, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty easy, but, it, but I'm afraid, I don't want to rely on this, but I'm afraid it depends on the facts. So there's, there's, there's a certain amount of cases which are obvious, uh, where the language used or the conduct is just obviously related to a protected characteristic. Um, those are not going to trouble us. And there's other ones which are not so obvious. So the guidance says that where words used, for example, don't refer to the protected characteristic, that really what you need to do is scrutinize the exact words together with the context and then establish whether there's any negative association. Um, but essentially the guidance on this is that related to has broad meaning. There's a case called Hartley in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Uh, so evaluating the evidence in the round I think that it's pretty broad. And so um, if you can make that out, then, you, then I think you've got a decent chance of establishing harassment claim. Question from Neil Coombs. Is there any point in bringing a direct discrimination claim on the same facts as a harassment claim because the two are mutually exclusive? I think that's a one word answer or one sentence answer, Paul. Uh, the answer is yes, because plead them in the alternative. Um, but um, yes, as you say, under section two, uh, 212 of the Equality Act, you can't succeed in both. Boyana Petrovic, are employers obliged to act on allegations of sexual harassment if the alleged victim isn't willing to put in a formal statement because of fear of retaliation? Paul Livingston. Um, the answer is yes. Uh, you are obliged to, well, my view is the answer is yes, that you are obliged to take uh, some action. Um, so anonymous allegations is a really tricky um, issue, um, but essentially it depends on which branch of anonymous allegations it is. So if the employer knows the identity of the person, but that person isn't willing to have their name put forward, 
um, then there is actually some, some guidance in a, in a case from 1989 called Linfood Cash and Carry uh, versus Thompson, which basically says that what an employer has to do is make sure there's a complaint in writing, try and ensure as much detail as provided as possible, then, take, then make further investigations to seek any corroboration, so have any other people um, been subject to, to harassment, um, and then you can make some, some tactful inquiries, that's the word used in the case, uh, into the character background of, or background of the complainant. So for example, do, might they have any reason to submit a malevolent complaint? I must say, in my experience, the number of malevolent or false allegations is really pretty small. And it tends to be something that um, men focus on to try and uh, reduce the significance of sexual harassment claims. Um, but then I think when it comes to the, the final step that you might want to take against the harasser, disciplinary proceedings, you, you really need to consider whether the, the, the person accused of harassment has had the opportunity to know the case against them and has had the opportunity to respond. So if you can reduce the complaint into writing enough um, that they have the opportunity to respond, I think you can go ahead. Uh, but you just need to be a bit careful with it. Um, and if you don't know who the person is as the employer, uh, it's a bit more tricky. But again, I think you should still be investigating, um, trying to seek out what can happen. And, you know, the action that you're going to take doesn't need to be disciplinary action. You might not be able to take disciplinary action in anonymous complaint cases, but you can hold training, you can perhaps address a specific team about their conduct, or for example, if, if someone keeps on making harassing comments in meetings, you can just say that in meetings, this is the conduct we expect. So I think act, yes, but it depends on the circumstances as to what that action would be. Thanks. I, I tend to give very slightly different advice to a lot of employers in this situation, which is that, um, if the allegation is well-founded, you're going to be liable in a tribunal whether you investigate or not, and it's not really going to affect the compensation. If it's not well-founded, you won't be liable in a tribunal if, if uh, they sue you. The real relevance of, or the real significance and implication of not investigating a complaint once you know about one is that it scuppers your chance of relying on the statutory defence in future cases of discrimination. Um, and I think that's often a commercial decision that a lot of employers take. Is that something you've ever thought about, Paul? Yeah, that's exactly right. I think the other thing is that if uh, someone makes an anonymous complaint but says, I want you to investigate, it could be a breach of the implied term of trust and confidence to not do anything. Um, if you just say, no, it's anonymous, I can't do anything, in my view, that would probably be a breach of the implied term, even if the employee wanted to remain anonymous. Um, I think also there's the issue that if, if there's one anonymous complaint and you don't do anything and then there's more, uh, then I think you're, you, I mean, you've, for one thing, aside from the legal liability, you've allowed that conduct to go on because you haven't done anything about it. Uh, we're asking questions to Paul Livingstone from Outer Temple Chambers on the question of harassment under the Equality Act. The next question is from Caroline Rochford. I think I'm going to rephrase this slightly. Is calling somebody a paedophile likely to amount to conduct based on a protected characteristic? Yes, uh, I think that it will depend. So th this is something that does depend on the context. The, in, so I, I don't know if there's any case law on it, but some, an example which I have seen in some other work, in fact, is that um, somebody who was Catholic uh, was called uh, a pedo because uh, at that time there was a lot of press about people in the Catholic Church being pedophiles. Uh, in my view, if somebody called someone who was a Catholic uh, a pedo, that would and could be harassment related to a protected characteristic. Um, I know that there's an issue um, with, with certain other things as well, but that, that's the only obvious one that comes to mind um, for me. Um, because as far as I'm aware that, I mean, I guess um, another example that could happen is um, in relation to some of the um, lurid press allegations about grooming gangs and things like that. If there was a reference to uh, a Muslim or Pakistani Muslim person as, as a paedophile uh, in the context of those headlines, I think that could potentially be harassment related to religious belief or, or ethnicity uh, as well. Question from... Paddy, 
If an employee with a behavioural disability, such as autism or mental health problems, inadvertently behaves in a way that another employee might find harassing, how far does the employer have to go to make reasonable adjustments before dismissing the disabled employee? So this is bringing into, into the um, sphere conflicts of rights, which is always a very, very tricky issue in discrimination law. Yeah, it is a tricky one. I think that, um, again, it's a bit of a how long, how far is, how long is a piece of string, but I think you need to take some reasonable adjustments. So um, this sometimes um, comes out in cases involving Tourette's syndrome, where people have made comments um, that possibly arise from their disability, and those might be harassing comments, but, but equally it can apply in autism or other cases. I think that um, looking into whether um, there's anything that can be done to reduce the, the amount of comments that are made um, and looking into whether there's anything that you as an employer could do to try and reduce the possibility of these type of comments. So for example, um, if the comments only arise in relation to one employee, then perhaps uh, separating those employees or maybe not having a customer facing role. But I think essentially it's do what you can to see whether somebody uh, can stay employed and continue to do their job without being dismissed. But ultimately, if it comes to it, then, then you probably can dismiss at the end of that. I don't know what you think, Daniel. Well, I think that's right. And, and in, uh, tribunals do understand the rock and hard place defence. Uh, you know, the, the employer is going to be criticised if they don't do anything and going to be criticised if they do do something. Uh, and, and in my experience, tribunals are actually quite sympathetic to that. They, they understand that the employer, if they do discipline or dismiss the person with mental health problems, will face a claim. And if they don't discipline or dismiss the person with mental health problems, they'll face a claim from someone else. Um, and, and I don't think it's right to say there's a range of reasonable responses test in harassment, but in practice, it can often look remarkably like it. Um, question from Nigel Forsyth, which is actually quite similar to Leslie Thompson's question. So I'm going to ask you both questions, Paul Livingstone, and you can answer either both or indeed neither if you want. Um, Nigel Forsyth asks, how does one address the defence of the harasser after the ending of a consensual relationship that they would have treated a same sex ex-partner in the same way? And Leslie Thompson asks, is it fair to dismiss a male employee where the female employee complains of sexual harassment when she was on a private date with that male employee? Um, so, so in relation to Nigel's question, um, I think you would, you would rely on Section 26.3 of the Equality Act. And that um, basically says that um, you're entitled to claim under that if there is less favourable treatment because of an employee because that employee rejected or submitted uh, to sexual harassment or harassment related to gender reassignment or sex. Now, if that consensual relationship itself uh, involved no um, sexual harassment um, and if there's... Um, harassment after the consensual relationship, it's just going to come down to was that conduct unwanted and was it either sexual harassment or harassment related to sex? I think it's very unlikely that that would be harassment related to sexual orientation anyway. Um, and perhaps Nigel's maybe uh, talking about a, a direct discrimination claim instead of, instead of harassment. Um, with regard to Leslie's question about whether it's fair to dismiss where a female employee complains of sexual harassment, when she's on a private date with another male employee. Um, I think, yes, it is, um, it is my view. I think you need to be a bit careful about it and consider the circumstances um, and consider, for example, the, the conduct policy. But my view is that um, if one of your employees has gone out with a, uh, another employee and sexually harassed them, then you, you should be able to take disciplinary action in relation to that conduct, even though it's outside of work, because I think it's, it could well be an extension of the workplace, uh, like in, in that case of Stubbs. Uh, Daniel, I, I know, I mean, it's a bit tricky because it does depend on context. For example, if they were of different levels, so if the male employee was a manager, it would be even more likely that you could dismiss for it. But it does depend on your policy, I think. Uh, Amy, I'm going to skip your question. I'm sorry, but I think it's a little long and a little specific. Um, Rachel Krasno asks, and Rachel's one of our speakers next week, uh, on family-friendly rights. Can harassment claims 
based on perceived disability be brought in the vein of English and Sanderson blinds. So that would include a situation where the employer knows the victim isn't disabled, but uses disability as an insult. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. I think that the law on this is a little bit unclear because there was some case law that suggested that you did need to establish disability because otherwise um, it wasn't a protected characteristic that you could rely on at all. I mean, my view is that the, the, the principled position is that you should be able to uh, rely on uh, rely on perceived disability in such claims. So if, if someone's using offensive language uh, related to the disability about another employee, uh, then to my view that, that that should count as harassment as long as the other um, criteria are fulfilled. I don't know if you have a different view, Daniel. I'm not expressing a view on that one, Paul, because I don't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. Melanie Bonas. Melanie, I think your question's been asked and answered by somebody else. Uh, Cheryl Moulinshot asks, Oh, good question. Um, do you have any tips, Paul Livingston, for defending an unwanted touching allegation in a busy and noisy kitchen environment where typically people will place a hand on the back or the arm of a person when passing behind them to make sure that other person doesn't step backwards? It's been claimed to be sexual harassment. Yeah, uh, so I, I've, I've done uh, one or two cases uh, involving this exact type of sort of un unwanted touching. Um, and as with a lot of the other stuff, it, it does depend on, on context. I think the way that you would defend it, in my view, is looking at whether the objective part of the effect test. So you, you can't really defend on whether it was unwanted touching. If the claimant has good evidence to say that they thought it was unwanted uh, and the tribunal thinks that it was unwanted, then that's enough. Um, but if you look at whether it was reasonable to have that effect, my view would be that you'd probably want evidence from other employees as to whether it was normal for touching to uh, happen in the, in the kitchen. You'd want probably some evidence about, for example, how big the kitchen was. Um, but my view is you'd really be looking at whether it was reasonable for a touch on the shoulder or the back in a kitchen uh, to create this sort of effect that you're looking at. And I mean, the courts have been quite clear that really um, the effect test is quite a significant one. So, so they've said that it shouldn't just be sort of one small thing and they don't want to create a culture of hypersensitivity. So, I mean, my view is that that sort of thing in itself is very unlikely to count as sexual harassment. But if there's a background of sort of comments and, or other touching, you might struggle a bit more. Uh, could, could you also argue, I suppose, that uh, touching someone on the back in a kitchen environment to warn them not to step backwards doesn't have the purpose or effect of creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment? Can you come at it from that angle? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's exactly the angle I, I, I would come at. It. I'd be saying that, I mean, it almost certainly didn't have the purpose. And but in terms of effect, I would be saying that either it didn't have that effect or it wasn't reasonable for it to do so. And the other thing is, of course, for it to be sexual harassment, you need to establish that the conduct was sexual. So if you're touching someone on the shoulder or the back, that isn't inherently sexual. And so you may be able to argue that actually there was nothing sexual about it. Uh, we have a question. I'm, I'm afraid I'm absolutely guaranteed to pronounce your name incorrectly, so I apologise in advance from Eloise Ramage Hayes. Uh, and Eloise asks, how is a tribunal's view of covert recordings likely to develop? In a harassment case, such evidence may be the only evidence that can prove a case. My, let me just take this first, if I could, Paul. Um, my experience, Eloise, of covert recordings and that sort of situation is that tribunals will invariably say, tut tut, that's a bit naughty, now let's listen to the recording. Um, there, there's a slightly more sophisticated answer, but that's what it really comes down to. But Paul, what's the more sophisticated answer? Well, that's my experience as well. I mean, I had a case which wasn't actually a sexual harassment case where uh, an employee had actually not just covertly recorded audio, but he'd actually had his phone in his pocket uh, recording video as well. And actually the tribunal said if it was relevant, they'd watch or listen to it, but they'll take into account, you know, whether there's any entra entrapment or anything like that. I think the key thing, uh, if you're advising uh, someone that's experiencing harassment, is that that isn't the only evidence that they, that they can have. So there are uh, things, so for example, talk to spot or even emailing yourself on the same day, creating some contemporaneous evidence of what's happened to you, in my view, is going to be really good evidence in, in the tribunal claim. And um, it, it, if it's just coming down to covert recordings, that's a bit problematic, I'd have thought, but a tribunal will usually accept that as evidence.
Question from Neil Miller. I think we've got time for two more questions, Paul. Neil Miller asks, from your experience, what level of injury to feelings awards do you see in tribunals for sexual harassment cases? For example, what sort of level of injury to feelings award would be given in the case of a manager sending inappropriate texts and making lurid comments to a junior? Well, I mean, as everyone knows, the, the level of an injury to feelings award doesn't depend on the conduct itself. It depends on the effect of the conduct. So really, even that common case won't necessarily be the same in each case, because if somebody um, has, if that's really affected someone that's made them go off sick from work, perhaps because of previous um, things that had happened to them, then actually the injury to feelings award might be quite high, whereas someone else might be you know, really quite offended by it, but be fine by you know the next month. Um, my view is that you can get quite a range from that, probably starting in the lower ventral bands, the mid uh, sort of 5,000 going up to 15,000. But you know something as, as uh, small as that could lead to a really high award as well, in my view. And I think we're going to finish, Paul, with a question that I'm not sure whether it's seriously intended or not. Uh, it's about five, six questions down, if you want to scroll down on the list. It's from James Fairchild. And James asks, what advice would you give to someone who is sleeping with a colleague? I would advise them to check their employer's policy and see whether there is a policy requiring disclosure of any sexual relationships between uh, his colleagues. Some uh, employers have that. There's some banks that have implemented that pretty recently. Uh, if that, that those employees actually work on the same things together, uh, I would disclose it regardless because I think that avoids any risk of um, unfair treatment. And if one employee is a uh, superior to another, uh, then I would try and ensure that that relationship changed uh, the work relationship. But I, I tend to think that transparency on this uh, is a pretty good way forward. I appreciate it's not something that every couple will want to do is to tell their boss uh, as soon as they start sleeping together. But if it's something more serious, perhaps I think uh, disclosing it is a good idea. Thank you. That was Paul Livingston from Outer Temple Chambers. Paul Livingston, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do so? Uh, the best way is either via email to paul.livingston, without an e, uh, at outertemple.com or on Twitter at plivingston67. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul Livingston from Outer Temple Chambers. Thank you for joining us. Everybody else, thank you so much, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.